Y'all wide awake and ready for this day? I uh, hope so. It's good to see you. Uh, privileged to be here. We actually live in Colorado now. We live up in the mountains at just over 9,000 feet. We're enjoying the weather, warmer weather here for right now. Looks like some cold coming. When we get home, I don't think I'll be, out, be able to actually get to my home in my truck because we've gotten quite a bit of snow since I left. So I bring my very warm clothes. When I get there, I can hike up to get the plow to be able to open the road. If any of you want to go with me, it's really fun. It's great to be here today. Let me open this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the privilege you give us to uh, know you personally. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we have for the future. Not a, a hope of wondering, but a hope of surety, a, a promise that you've made to us. And Lord, while we long to be with you one day, we know that you've left us here intentionally. And Lord, as we consider that, God, I pray that what we've heard over this weekend will be translated into how we live every moment of every hour of every day of our lives till we have the privilege of seeing you face to face. I pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've been talking about setting our mind on the things above this whole weekend. And so I want to talk to you about how it looks if you're setting your mind on things above, but your feet are on this earth. How does that translate? Because I think oftentimes that's just misunderstood. So my topic this morning is death is gain, facing death, and finishing well. So all of that, there's a lot of elements, and so I will do the best I can to talk through both the issues of what it looks like in our lives right now in whatever stage of life we are, but I'm also going to talk about what that looks like when uh, we get older like some people are. Yeah. Death is an enemy. It's the last enemy. Death is a hard, hard thing. In 1 Corinthians 15:22. It says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I especially enjoy the second part of that verse. <laughs> the first part can be very difficult. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and following, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And then it says, This perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it ends with this very precious verse when it says, therefore... Knowing that, that through death, we come into that perfect relationship with Christ. Therefore, knowing that, having the confidence in that, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, the knowledge of what is yet to come for those that truly understand the gospel is absolutely life-changing and life-orienting. 
So facing death is facing that last enemy. The process is not something that we look for. We look forward to where that takes us. But going through that process is, uh, can be a scary thing. It can be a difficult thing. Ultimately, physical death is a consequence for sin. And, you know, sometimes people get, I get mad at God for all of these things, you know. And I remember I was talking to somebody. Uh, he said, well, I can't believe in God because all of these bad things happen in this world. And I just want you to know, Rock, that I've seen some really hard things in this life. And, da, 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 and it's like, wow, because I know this person and I've shared the gospel with them many times. And I said, so that's bizarre. You know, and he's wondering like you're wondering. Oh, what's he going to say? And I said, you, so you see all these awful things in the world that are a consequence of your sin, my sin, everybody's sin, including death, and you get mad at God, who is the only one who has provided a solution to your miserable condition and mine, and can give hope in the midst of all of the foolishness that we've lived. You choose to get mad at God and still love your sin rather than hating your sin and choosing to love God. I said, I'm just telling you. Doesn't make sense to me. You understand what I'm saying? You know, this is a part of who we are and God is the one who's chosen to redeem us and give us hope. So when you walk down these difficult roads, you, you don't get mad at God for all of it. You can hate sin more and more. But love the God who's made a way and made provision. So I want you to turn in your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And we're going to just walk through some of the elements of this verse as we talk about what it, what it looks like to have a right perspective in this life. Now, keep in mind that the apostle is writing his last letter. He is going to die. And so he's giving final instructions and encouragement. When we get to verses 7 and 8, he's actually reflecting back on his life. Okay? He's reflecting back. I remember I was in a church not here, but prior to this, and I was in the, the church office, and there was an older lady in the church office, and she was just pouring out her heart. She'd been in church all of her life, but she said, nonetheless... I have wasted most of my life. Not that she didn't come to church, but you guys, that was like the extent of her service to Christ. And she came to realize that. And, and she was just sharing. I was actually young then. And she was sharing with me how disappointed she was in the lack of biblical perspective about what this life is about. She's at the end of her life. Well, the Apostle Paul's at the end of his life. That's not how he's thinking. That's not he's, how he's thinking. And, and I just want you to know, if you don't have the right perspective of the Christian life, you won't be able to say these words. If you have the right perspective of the Christian life, surely you'll be able to say these words when you come to the end. So he starts off by saying, I have, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Hendrickson writes, when, when Paul thus summarizes his past, he's not boasting except in the Lord. He is recording what grace has achieved in the heart of sinners. You see, at the end of the day, when you finish the fight, or fight the fight, finish the course, you guys, at the end of the day, your obedience is a result of God's gracious work in your life, and you're simply living in submission to that grace. It's been said well here that the grace that saves you is the same grace that sanctifies you. That's why you can't say you're, you're a Christian and your life doesn't change. You're lying to yourself. And, and I've often told people, you know, at the end of the day when you face the Lord, it doesn't really matter if you say, I know you, Jesus. 
The only thing that matters if Jesus says, I know you. Right? There could be tons of people that say, I know you, Lord. And he's going to say, I, I don't know you. Wouldn't that be awful? Just awful. So understanding what this looks like. So he begins with, I have fought the good fight. Fight comes from a Greek word where we get our word agonize. I have fought the good fight. Hendricks had said it's, it's been a fight against Satan, against the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this darkness in the heavenlies, against Jewish and pagan vice and violence, against Judaism among the Galatians, against fanaticism among the Thessalonians, against contention, fornication, and litigation among the Corinthians, against incipient Gnosticism among the Ephesians and Colossians, against fightings without and fears within, and last but not least, against the law of sin and death operating in his own heart. We're in a fight. We're in a fight. If, if you don't feel like you're in a fight, what's going on? We are in a battle a battle to walk in a way that exalts the one who saved us. We are in a battle because we're here on this earth to make sure every person we have the opportunity to come in contact with, that we are alert and ready to proclaim the message of the gospel. But I'm telling you honestly, I don't think most Christians or most people who call themselves Christians are they're not in the battle, they're coming to church. This is a battle. Agony. Mount says it's not that he has fought well, but that the fight of Christian ministry is inherently good and is worth the battle. The Apostle Paul, when he was saved on that road to Damascus, God set him on a course of ministry and service and conviction and commitment. You remember with the what the Lord told Ananias about the ministry of Paul? He says, uh, I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. I, we like that God calls us to be his children. First Peter 2, he also calls us to suffer for righteousness. You understand? In the same way he calls us to be his children, he calls us to suffer. That, that's an essential part of the Christian life. Paul was on a clear course, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable Therefore, listen, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So when you think about that, how are you living your life? I, I mean, your Christian life and testimony. I, are, are you on a course? Do you know what that looks like? Are you recognizing why God left you here if he saved you? Are you actively and intentionally living that out? What is your life all about? The people who know you best, the people who see you most, if they were to describe your life, what would they say? What would they say? Would they say, my dad loves the Lord more than any other person or thing on this earth. I mean, it's just clear. He talks about the Lord at home. He's sharing the gospel, talking to us, asking us to pray for his business associates. I mean, he, he studies God's word. We don't just have prayer around dinner. He prays. What did your kids say about mom? What would your friends say about you? What would your business associates? 
Because at the end of the day, if, if we're running in such a way as not without aim, our life is about something. That's not, I'm not talking Sundays, okay? That's obviously a part, but Sundays is just for the sake of equipping and ministering to one another. Why? See, we make a difference in this world. So what are some of the dimensions of the fight? Not exhaustive, but some. Top of the list is personal suffering. That's a theme throughout the scriptures. Philippians chapter 1, verses 29 to 30 It says, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Experience the same conflict, that's that same word, agony, which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. You guys, oftentimes, and I'm going to spend a bit of time here, because oftentimes, when we think about suffering, we just think about ourselves. Man, my life is hard. My circumstances are hard. God, why are you allowing me to go through this? And and it can be in any number of ways. And we'll talk about suffering at the end of life and death and how we maintain a testimony. But you guys, I'm just talking generally that, that when difficult circumstances come in our lives because of our unredeemed sinful element of our lives, we tend to focus primarily on the fact that I'm going through difficult circumstances. So I'll give you some easy ones. Any of you ever get in a, like a minor car accident, fender bender? I'm not gonna ask if it's your fault or somebody else's, okay? Let's say you get in that accident, right? What do you, what, what's the first thing that, not that goes through your mind, but maybe somebody around you. What what, what are the things that go through your mind? Somebody runs in the back of your car, boom. What do you think? Come on, this is class participation. What's that? That was nice. Are you okay? And then where do you go from there? Debbie. Oh oh no, there goes my schedule for the day. Come on. Not my fault. Why did it hit me? You know what? Come on, God. Or... Maybe we don't talk to God like that, but we talk to the person. I can't believe, I'm like, what's wrong with that person? For crying out loud. And now insurance and deductibles and da-da-da-da, right? I mean, it's just easy to go there. I'm just saying, you know. But in reality, what's potentially happened? Well, first of all, you are definitely going to meet at least one person that you didn't intend to meet that day. Okay, so here's a question for you. Do you believe that God is intentional? Okay, I want commitments now. All the time? Okay, okay, you know, I'm going to lead you down. I'm just, I'm going to, I don't like to trick anybody. I'm going to lead you down a path, okay? So just think carefully because I'm, so, so you believe God's intentional all the time. Oh, you got weak. Yes. Shane, right? All the time, okay? Do you believe God in his life has divine appointments for you in life? Okay, we're picking up speed, okay? Do you believe he has divine appointments for you, ministry opportunities, I could call them, every day of your life? How are you doing with them? I think a lot of times we think evangelism is uh, it's just something you do somewhere. And I'm not opposed to that. But that does not satisfy God's call for our lives as Christians. Why did he leave you on this earth if you're redeemed? It's so the unbeliever can hear the gospel. And you guys, you have to understand. Listen to what Paul says. He's in jail. He's in prison. Philip uh, de Corsi spoke on this, Philippian, uh, about his imprisonment, but earlier in that chapter in Philippians 1.12, it says, now I want you to know, brethren, this is Paul, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. That person you hit could need more than anything to, s- to hear the gospel message. Have somebody come out and have the concern, not only are they hurt, but are they saved? Or are they a Christian who's struggling in life? 
circumstance. We see circumstances about us. You guys, I'm just telling you, circumstances are about the gospel. It's about the gospel in our lives, and it's about the gospel being ministered through our lives. And, and so, so when you begin to think about that, so that in each given day of your life, you wake up in the morning thinking, I have this appointment, that appointment, that point. Does God, did God give you a job just so that you could provide for your family? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, that's part of his plan. But it's ultimately so you can be a testimony to those people. It's so that you look for opportunity. You see a business appointment. It may be a gospel appointment. But you guys, we get so much into the routine of just life, life and busyness and here and there that it's easy to forget that. And you, a week goes by, a month goes by, a year goes by. And, and you guys, it's not. I mean, if you're saying, yeah, I, I remember I got to share the gospel one time, you know, back in. There are lost people around us all the time. I'm not saying I get it all right. Please know that. I'm just telling you. There are gospel opportunities around us all the time. But if we live our Christianity as a Sunday to Sunday event or Sunday to Wednesday event, we don't wake up in the morning anticipating that I'm in the fight. (laughs) I need to see people like God sees them. When suffering comes into my life, I need to ask myself, God, how can this be used for your glory? Because it can be a lawsuit. You're going to meet people you didn't need to meet. You can be unemployed. You're going to meet people you didn't want to have to meet just by virtue of going out and interviewing. If God has placed you in a neighborhood, he didn't just do that so you can have that house that you especially liked. It's because ministry. It's ministry. All of your life is about ministry. Everything you do, all of your schedule, it's about. And so we've got to get into the fight and recognize, quit, quit thinking, you know, and I, don't, don't get me wrong. I get the pain of personal suffering. I'm just saying, you can't get so focused on it that you fail to see that God will accomplish his purposes in it. Be alert. Make a difference in the name of Jesus. Don't fight suffering, you guys. Paul said in his last letter, 2 Timothy 2.10, I am willing to endure anything for the sake of those who are chosen that they may also have eternal life. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to endure anything so that others would come to Christ? Because he was. And you know, when he wrote that, you remember what his life had been like? He endured a lot. Part of fighting the fight is that we have a deep, genuine concern for others. In Colossians 2.1, it says, For I want you to know how great a struggle, it's the word agonize, How great a struggle I've had on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Paul had a genuine, passionate, consuming love for people. And what was his concern for them? Because he's talking about his fellow believers here. He wanted desperately for them to be walking with Jesus. He was consumed with wanting to help them walk with Jesus. And so, you guys, when we talk about service in the church, let me just clarify something. So, let's say you're serving in children's Sunday school. That is a service that you can offer as unto the Lord. Is that your service? Well, it's like a, an element of your service. Because it's a dangerous thing to do. Well, I already serve, and da-da-da. You guys, do you remember what Jesus said? I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Service is not an event, okay? Service is a life. 
And so you can serve in the children's ministry and, and feel like you've, you're done. But as soon as you walk out of there and start across this campus to go to church, there are people all around you. you got to keep your eyes open. God, help me to see and recognize needs. And you see somebody, I remember, I, remember I worked here a long time. The Lord convicted me deeply, you know, because I can walk by somebody in the sidewalk, and I'm busy because i got a ministry over here, ministry, you know, one over here. And I'm walking by, and I ask Shane, I just met Shane yesterday, so I'm picking on you, but I think you're game, okay? I can walk by him and say, hey, Shane, good to see you. You doing okay? And, you know, he might say, I'm okay. And then I can just keep walking. Or I can say, something's wrong. I, I, I mean, he didn't, you know, it's not like I'm doing good. No, the problem is, uh, to really find out, I'm going to have to stop. And I'm going to have to look at him. And I ask, that didn't sound right. What's going on? You okay? And then while I'm doing that, I could be looking back here and around back there and you know? But if I'm really concerned about it, I'm going to look at him and I'm going to talk to him. And if I don't have much time, I'm going to take enough time to say, hey, can we get together for a cup of coffee this week? But then I need to be willing to give the time to do But I'm busy. You guys, busyness is escape from responsibility in many ways. There are things that we could call to focus on the things that are most important. Paul is deeply concerned about his fellow believers it's not casual it's not you know hey how you doing it's just a you know that in our culture that's just kind of a greeting you're not really asking but if you're going to get in the battle you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone you're going to have to be willing to slow down look somebody in the eyes and genuinely care and when you say I'm going to pray for you again it's not just one of those cultural hey hey you're going to pray, and you're not going to just pray, Lord, bless Shane, help him to get it worked out. You look at the prayers of Scripture, folks. I'm just telling you, we can pray for physical things, and we should cast all our cares upon him. You look at the prayers of Scripture. They are richly spiritual. They're never focused primarily or solely on physical they always go beyond that. I, I'm, you, you understand what I'm saying? Casting all your care upon him. I get that. You can bring all your cares. But I'm saying, when you pray for somebody, you marry it to the spiritual truths and the things that are going to be most essential. You know, I used to tell the youth group, this is going to sound offensive, but you're a group that I think, I'm just talking fast, right? We'll move it. You know, they'd pray for grandma. And, and, and you, got, you just got health problems. And I say, we will pray for grandma. But I just want to remind you, that one day grandma is going to die. And we, we must remember her spiritual condition. If she's a believer, here are some things that we can pray. If you're not sure, here's some things. Or if you're pretty sure she's not, a, here are some things that we can pray. But you guys, I think even in our culture, that even our prayers can become just superficial of kind of passing in the moment. That's not where Paul was. He was deeply concerned and spiritual in how he thought about things. And, and you guys, I mean, you talk a man who, about a man who gave up, a, a com gave up the possibility of a comfortable life, and he never had a comfortable life. And he didn't care because people's souls were so much more important. In the battle, there's going to be great opposition to the gospel. In, in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, it says, But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. <laughs> you, know, you know what it's like. I mean, Paul goes to one town, they beat him up, run him out, and he goes to the next town and keeps doing the same thing. Temptation for us? Share the gospel with somebody? Don't respond well? Uh, I don't think that's God's call for me to do that. That is God's call. Amid much opposition. You're not concerned about the opposition. You're concerned about communicating the gospel to whoever will listen, knowing that God and his grace will save some. Our responsibility is to carry the message. God's responsibility is to 
save souls as only he can. So the glory we have is that we take the opportunities to share. We minister to the, the gospel to people. And you guys, when people oppose us, you know when it says amid much opposition, that's the word agony. Okay? So in the midst of the agony, in the midst of people treating me awful, because it's a scary thing when people say, I've come to know the truth of the gospel, it's transformed my life. You guys, think about who you were. We do that just every now and then, just to make sure everybody's paying attention. That's, that's like the heater system in there. They, they've regretted that one, but hey. Uh. <laughs> uh, you guys, when it comes to the, the sharing the gospel, we need to understand that there will be opposition, but, but to pull back from that and to not do it is shameful. You guys, you were blind one time. If you're here Christian today, weren't you blind? You were blind. You were dead. Somebody brought you the gospel. You know, you say, well, I, I, don't, I just can't imagine them getting saved. Well, I can't imagine you getting saved. And you can't imagine me getting saved. I think about what I'd, like, what I'd be like if I was an unbeliever. I mean, honestly, that just, that brings terror to my soul. God has been so kind. So when it comes to the God, you guys, what's the Great Commission? going to the whole world and you're proclaiming the gospel discipling training people because that i mean we call it the great commission is it the great commission in your life because if it is it dominates your life it's not an on occasion it dominates your life you're constantly looking for opportunities so that's part of the fight the battle against sin that's part of the fight. It says in Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Mm, the, the race. That's the challenge that we have before us. That's the fight that we are involved in. Interesting that it says, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. You guys, I, th I think sometimes uh, we get so busy doing so many things and then we excuse our spiritual priorities because we say, I am just so busy. How do you think that sounds? in the years of God for the one who sent his perfect son to live a perfect life to be treated terribly brutalized and even on the cross when they mocked him and said come off that cross which he could have done and destroyed them all he endured that why well in Hebrews 12 it says he endured it for the joy set before him, despising the shame. And he sat home down at the right hand of God. I mean, you get that? You guys, I, I mean, when you think about what God has done, and then you say, I'm so busy, that should kind of turn your stomach. So you know what I, here's what I recommend, because, uh, I think that is a challenge oftentimes for people. I'm just so busy, it's hard to think spirit. It's hard to get up in the morning, really spend time in the Word. It's hard to meditate because I'm so busy. Here's what, you know, because what happens is people say, yeah, I need to change my habits. So I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, spend a little time in the Word. So rather than just doing that, this is just a personal recommendation. I would tell you, put everything you do down on a piece of paper. What I used to do to just torment people that come in for counseling with issues like that, I would give them a page that was 24 hours a day, broke down in 30-minute intervals. I'd give them enough for a week, and I'd say, take this home and fill it out, bring it back. I'd like to take a look. Maybe I got one or two of those back, maybe. Usually they'd come back, and I'd say, Wait, where, where are those? Oh, forgot it. Oh, it's painful. I would put it all down. And you want to reorient your life and priorities if you're struggling here? 
then look at everything that you could call from that list to give you as much time as you could possibly use to become and to be who God wants you to be. Because when you just do that, I'm going to add, a, you know, I'm going to try to get up a little earlier. I'm going to try to stay up a little later. Uh, my experience says that seldom is very helpful because we're really talking about life reorientation. We're, we're talking about cleaning up your schedule. And, and you know what? When, when we have to get rid of the encumbrances, the truth is there's some things that you really enjoy doing and they take a fair amount of time. Maybe you ought to let them go. Well, yeah, but the gospel, perfect savior, your redemption, yeah, but. Because we have to become a people that thinks seriously about spiritual things. We have to be like that if we're going to honor the one who gave his life for us. You know, that second, you know, he talks about the fight. Then he says, I've finished the course. In Acts 20, 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Did you see that? I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. I am not the center of my life. What happens to me in this life is insignificant. What joys I have, you know, we, we live, you know, I, boy, God, I, I mean, Surely you're going to let me get married. God, surely you're going to let me have children. Surely you're going to let me have a good child. Surely you're going to give me this. Surely you're going to give me that. He gave you life. Now you give him your life with open hands. And know that if he doesn't give you those things you want, it's because he has purposes that he, he intends to use you for that that is not going to help in accomplishing them. He has not failed you. And sometimes the expectations that we have of God, it's like we need to, when he says, I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself, that's open hands. I just want to live this life for your glory. Whatever that means. And I'm not saying, God, bring on the worst circumstances. Ah. I'm saying being willing to go through whatever and staying alert to the ministry opportunities that God would have for you. You know, even in the challenges of life, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10, remember the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, he prayed that God would take it away. And he prayed again, and he prayed again. And God said, no. And then as Paul understood, this is intentional. It's intentional. I remember when I was going through a difficult time when our son had been in an awful car accident. They didn't think he'd live. And we're walking down a difficult road. I remember somebody came up to me and said, man, it's neat to see you so strong. It's like, you must be kidding. Must be kidding. I stay at the hospital night and day. I drive home crying. Is that strong? Not really. But it's not my strength, right? You know, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. You say, well, I don't think I'm strong enough to endure that. You, that's the point. That's the point. You're not. And so when God, when people see God strengthening you, when they see God working in your life and providing you, that's the testimony you have. It's not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps theology, you guys. It's we're dependent on him. And he can see us through anything. In Philippians 2.17, Paul describes himself, but even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. If my suffering is what it takes for your benefit, I will rejoice in the benefit that God brings to you. Philippians 3.8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Don't read that too casually. What happens to you if you suffer the loss of all things? God, really? Really? 
I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. I mean, how precious is the gospel to you? How precious is it to me? Is it that precious? God, I will let everything, anything go. If you take it all, I just want to be your servant, finish the, the, the work that you've given to me in a way that honors you. In Colossians 1.24, now I rejoice, he says, in my sufferings for your sake. I rejoice, not because he rejoices that he's suffering. He rejoices in the fact that as he goes through suffering, God uses it to minister to people. For Christians, they looked at Paul's life and said, you know, if you're willing to do that, I see how I need to step it up and do this. Okay? For the unbelievers, it was their opportunity to see the gospel lived out and to hear the gospel from him. It's too easy too easy for circumstances to be about us. We've got to be careful. Ephesians 2.10. 2, you know, we know to, we usually memorize 8 and 9. We don't usually memorize 10 for some reason. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So do you understand when God saved you, for those that are in Christ, when God saved you, he, he also had, had planned works for you to accomplish in this life. He's, he, he has works that he has ordained for you to accomplish by his grace in this life. And so you need to remember that, you know, ask yourself, am I accomplishing the works for which God redeemed me? It, it, it's not works that save you. It's, it's the works that flow from your heart because you want to honor him. So in Ephesians 4.1, it says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now, again... I'm covering a lot of territory. Walk in a manner worthy of the one who called you. Think of that. What does that look like for me to walk every day, every moment of the day, in a way that reflects even the worthiness of our Lord and the preciousness of the gospel? Think about it that way. Is my life demonstrating that? In Colossians 1.10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him, what? In all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In other words, your life is totally spiritually oriented. And when we talk bearing good fruit, you guys, the reality is, John 15 says, if you abide in Christ, that is, if you continue to grow in your relationship with Christ and you do that through his word, then the fruit, well, that, that will just be a part of your life. You're not concentrating on the fruit. You're concentrating on the biting in Christ. And the fruit comes. But you've got to be serious about that relationship with the Lord. Here's one. It is a good one to memorize. The one who says he abides in him, in Christ, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. That's Jesus. You say you abide in Christ, you should walk. walk. That, what's that? Every moment of every day, everywhere you go, everything that you do, you are trying to live in the same pattern that your Lord lived. That's our goal. That's our objective. Keep in mind, and this is encouraging, Philippians 1.6, I'm confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will carry it on completion until the day of Christ. Just a reminder we want to pursue God with all of our hearts, live for the Lord Jesus Christ in every way we can. But you guys, ultimately, in Philippians 2, 12, and 13, so then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is, live it out. And it says, for it is God at work in you who will accomplish his work according to his good pleasure. So, so we are serving him with our whole hearts, but you guys, he's the one through his grace that accomplishes his work. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting in John 17, 4, our Lord said, I glorified you on the earth. He's Jesus speaking to God in his uh, high priestly prayer, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the things that you have given me to do. That should be the goal of the believer, right? Is that we glorify God by accomplishing those works of Ephesians 2.10 that God has entrusted to us. 
And then he says, I've kept the faith. So Paul has remained true to his calling, his appointment as an apostle, a proclaimer of the gospel. In other words, what he says he believes, he actually lives. And, and let me just remind you that, that there is a danger in knowing God's truth, calling yourself a believer, and not living in light of the truth. Okay? So, think about it. What are the things that you know God wants you to do? This is group participation again. Share the gospel. Okay? Anybody here? Never mind. I was going to say, anybody disagree with that? It's like, because if you do, then it's going to be an awkward conversation for a while. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm assuming if you're here in Christ, you will understand that God didn't leave you here to enjoy this place and just have it. That's your whole, it's just, it's, you know, we just want to make sure you get what you want and you get a good marriage and you get a good job. And you, you. He left you here. Why? To share the gospel. Second Corinthians 5. We're ambassadors for Christ, begging people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So if you're as a believer, you know that. I'm only going to ask this next question for you to ponder in your mind. Don't speak, please. How are you doing with that? Because you meet people all the time like I meet people all the time. And if you're trying to roll the catalog through in your mind, and it's like, well, I That's knowing the truth and not living in obedience to it. Pretty scary when that's the Great Commission. I mean, that's all over the Scripture. You guys, to live life and not be communicating the gospel as a Christian, I'm, I'm not really sure what could be worse than that. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying we get it all right. But to just ignore it? Not think about it in a given day. Don't wake up in the morning considering what God opportunities God might have for us. It's not good. It's not good. What are some other things that we know God clearly wants us to do? Follow his commandments. You know, it's interesting. First John 5, it talks about uh, his commandments are not a burden to the believer. You know, if you say you abide in Christ, you walk what? In the same manner as he walked. You want to live in obedience. But you guys, living obedience is then dealing with things like the great commandment and evangelism, time in the word. You know, I, I call uh, uh, biblical meditation, I, I, I think it's kind of the lost Christian discipline. Love to do a whole session or five or ten on it. Biblical meditation means you are spending time in the Word, reading, studying, and the idea is you're doing it so you're always thinking about it. So through the course of the day, you are spiritually alert when opportunities come because the Word of God is on your mind. It's biblical meditation that helps you to fight sin. But, I mean, sometimes we're satisfied if we can just check off, I did my Bible reading this morning. You know, you can, go to, you can do your Bible reading your whole life and go to hell, right? Because the issue is what? It's that it's God's word and God's wisdom. And I don't have the wisdom I need for this day. And if God doesn't give me his wisdom, there is no way I can accomplish his eternal purposes. Right? So if you're the one of those, I, you know, my schedule's so busy, it's hard to find time for the word. You're lying to yourself, okay? You're lying to yourself. You love yourself and other things more than you love God. It has to be. It has to be. Because we do the things that we love. We do the things that we want to do. And you guys, you just have to understand that, that when it gets down to the, just the brass tacks reality is that you keep the faith, it means that you're living in light of what God has instructed you with. 
right? James says it well. You know, faith without works is dead. Well, it's easy to think those works are simply satisfied by attending church, and they're not. It's every moment of every day of your life. So then the future, you know, he says, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All who have loved his appearing. If you love his appearing, it's because you love him. You love him. Next hour, we're going to talk about some of the reasons that people want to go to heaven that have nothing to do with spiritual priorities, right? There's a number of them. But here it's because we love his appearing. And so the reason we're, we're living like this, the reason we're in the fight, we're on the course, we want to keep the faith is because we love him and we want to honor him. We're living in anticipation of the day that we'll be with him. And so when you think about it, I'm going to give you just a real brief phrase that if you want to think about it in these terms, and then I'm going to talk about death here for a little while. So, you know, how do you get to the end and have that end the way it should? Well, here's the deal. Die now, and you will live right so that you'll be ready to die again. Okay, some of you are going, what? And some of you are going, I know what you're saying. Die now so that you'll live right and you will be ready to die again. The theme is throughout Scripture. Romans 8, 13. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Galatians 5, 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 6, 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You guys, you have to die. You have to die to the sinful desires. You have to desire, die to the flesh. You, you, you have to die, be crucified in the sense that your life is all about the exaltation of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Your whole life. I mean, I'm not saying, it's okay. You want to be in sports and stuff like that? That's fine. But if you're only there to play basketball or football, it's not fine. You're there with those people for what? The sake of the gospel. Your testimony and your proclamation. And if you're one of those people that say, well, I just, live, I just demonstrate the gospel by my life, it's like, you're so deceived. You're so, come on. The gospel is a message that we declare. I get that you need to live the Christian life, but to excuse yourself from pro proclaiming the truth is nonsense. You've got to speak the truth. You say, well, I, but I, I don't... I don't know how to see, share the gospel. It's like, are you saved? Because at some point, if you're saved, you had to understand the gospel. Now, if you want to just learn more about how you can better share, there are classes here pretty regular. They will gladly help you. But, but you understand that that's what our life is about. Now, I would say as people get closer to the end of their life, Sometimes they think more about dying than living. You know, you start thinking. And, and we need to be careful of that. If we're going to finish well, we need to use every moment of our life to serve the Lord. So I want to talk about this some because there's a, I, I can't address every issue, but I just want to give you some that I've found to be a, maybe a little bit more uh, common. You understand that dying provides opportunities for the gospel. I've, I've often met with somebody in, in a hospital bed with a terminal diagnosis who is still able to think and, and, and interact. And I'll tell them, you know this, but I just want to remind you that 
even with a terminal illness, knowing that you're going to go see the Lord sometime in the near future, you have people walking in this room every day that are in far worse condition than you are, even though they have their physical health. If all you think is your, about is your diagnosis and your circumstance, then you won't even see those people walking in this door. And how great would it be in your dying days to share the gospel with a custodian that walks in the door, a nurse that walks in the door, a doctor that walks in the door, and they see that even as you progress toward death, one, your confidence is in the Lord, but if you're able to speak, you want them to know about Jesus. You have to remember, you guys, I mean... If God takes you down a hard road like that and you're now in the hospital a lot or doctor's offices, you have to think, why does God have me here? Is it just all about me? It's not all about you. You know, there are situations where maybe your loved one is in the hospital and they no longer have the cognitive abilities to speak. They're in that progression and sometimes people will say, you know, why would God leave my mom in that condition? She's a believer. Why would he leave her there week after week after week? I don't know the complete answer to that, but I do know that if you're in Christ, her circumstance now becomes your opportunity for the gospel. Your loved one's circumstance becomes your opportunity for the gospel as you go and show love and as you go and don't focus just solely on the fact that they're in this bed, how long will this go? You go with the reality in your mind and heart that God is allowing them to continue and I need to use the opportunities that I interact with people for the cause of the gospel. You just don't know, you guys. You just don't. But God's intentional, right? I mean, you don't, you don't, don't get to that point where you start questioning God. Question yourself. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're tempted to say, but why God? Stop. Ooh. Okay, change it around. How, God, can I serve you in this circumstance? The rest of it, I promise you, if you know Christ, I mean, I don't. So I don't, when we see the Lord <laughs> and we recognize how limited we are and how sin has so messed us up, we can't think, you know, I don't think there's going to be a lot of, now God, I wanted to ask, <laughs> okay? I think, first of all, we're going to be in a different position, you know, down on our knees, exalting him. And when we see him as he is, I just think it's, it's going to be, oh, I have no idea. He doesn't make mistakes. He just doesn't. Let me just give you a couple other things that I think you need to be careful as, as, as we approach death. Many of you know my wife, my first wife died. I stood by her side when she left this earth. And my kids, my boys were there with us. My in-laws, their, her parents were there as we stood in the hospital room. And we watched her die. 31 years of marriage. I'm remarried. This is my wife, Pam. I thank God for her. Can you even imagine what I'd be like without her? I'm a mess. She's such a blessing in my life. And I'm grateful for that. But you guys, I'm telling you, that's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. But I knew, I knew as I watched her and she took her last breath, you know what I knew? It's like, oh man. Can you even imagine what life is like in a moment of time? Think about it. Can you even imagine? I mean, her greatest day is, is my most difficult day. It's a glorious day for her. All that awful health and stuff like that, it's gone. In fact, I often think, I, I wish she could be the one kind of sharing things with you. It would be vastly more accurate. <laughs> right? It's glorious. But God didn't take me. And a lot of people, I hear this often among Christians. Well, if my spouse dies, I just want to die with them. 
If my child dies, I don't think I could live. Really? Really? Because I knew that when my wife died, he took her because she fought the fight, she finished the course, she kept the faith, and she's in the presence of Almighty God. And I'm still here, which tells me what? <laughs> I'm not finished. And I can wallow in my misery. And don't get me wrong. Grief is a challenging thing. It's a cha it is. Grief is legitimate. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope. And it's hard when you go home and you walk into the house and they're gone forever in this life. There's a lot of things you have to deal with. But you guys, one thing I knew. God is not done with me yet. By God's grace, I want to finish well. And I need to be faithful to that purpose. Is it easy? It doesn't matter if it's easy. What does that matter? I just want to accomplish what God has me here for. And then, <laughs> when I die... Celebration time, folks. Presence of Jesus. What a glorious thing. And so when we start saying that I don't want to live if they die, or oh, you talk about heaven, I just want to be with so-and-so and so. -and -so. This is the Lord Jesus, folks. I mean, there'll be the joy of seeing other people, but our focus is on our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what our life is is about. And when you start saying, I don't think I can live without them or live without them, you guys, what you're saying is the very things you prayed for and God kindly has given you have become idols in your life because you love them more than you love God. And if you love God supremely, if your goal is to love God first and foremost more than any other person, including yourself, you will trust God with all of your other loves. You will trust him. And I, I just want to emphasize, I, I'm really not in any way minimizing how difficult it can be to go through such major losses. But if I try to talk about that, I'll cry. And then you go, this is awkward. How do we end this? I mean, so it is. But you guys, it's not a life stopper and it's not a ministry stopper. God is good, always good. You can trust him all the time. And if you're here, don't stop accomplishing. Because even you'll find in your grief, you will be able to minister to other people. Even in your grief, even in those hard things, okay? So, I mean, I've just like unloaded a lot. But at the end of the day, here's what I'd encourage you to do on a regular basis. When you wake up in the morning and start your day, man, you've got to have your mind in the Word, okay? You've got to get the Word into your mind so you take it with you through the day. Find something in Scripture, and it can be a theme that you even meditate over an extended period of time, but wake up with a determination that I want to keep Scripture in my mind all day long, all right? When you pray in the morning, we will we'll almost always pray and we'll think through the events and we'll pray for the, the, our schedule for the day and then say, but God... Help me to be alert to the things that you want to accomplish in my life. Help me not to be so busy that I don't see them. Help me to have the courage to speak when I need to speak. And then at the end of the day, talk with whoever you're around about how that day went, opportunities you had. I'm just telling you, opportunities are everywhere. Everywhere, okay? All the time. And so it shouldn't be the rare event that you talk about these sweet things that God does. It should be a normal pattern of your life. And then if your life is so full that it's an issue, I, just, I, I would just urge you, put your schedule down and call anything that you can in order to make sure your priority stays consistent with God's priority. Appreciate your time. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for the time. Thanks for your word. Thanks for your kindness and your grace. The gospel, Lord, that you make available to us that we can know you through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. If there's anybody here that hasn't done that, God, oh, help them to know that you've made it available if they would repent and believe. Then, Lord, for those who are believers, Lord, help all of us be reminded. We're so distracted, all of us. Help us to be reminded every day that we're supposed to be walking 
in, in such a way that we, we pattern our lives after how you walked on this earth. Just pray for your help and thank you for your patience, God, in Christ's name, amen.